welcome to your folk congregational United Church of Christ, a congregation where we welcome and we serve and we care. And what a full week it was last week of a lot of us serving and caring for our young people. So it was a wonderful week and Robin did such a beautiful job organizing it. Robin. Robin. And, and while we're in the clappy mood, let's clap because we have Tina back on the organ. We have live organ music. All right, announcements. Uh, Friday, July 19th, this Friday, um, 6.30 p.m. is the Kane County Cougars game. Please see Robin if you have any questions or would like to purchase tickets. Summer movie discussion series Origin, uh, Tuesday, July 16th at 7 p.m. in the conference room. Please watch it ahead of time and come and talk about it. There is communion served after worship today. And some food is still needed for the Daybreak Homeless Shelter for July 19th on Friday. If you don't cook or bake, you can help by buying a few things. Please see Kathy. She's in back there if you have any questions. Youth group is starting up. So if you are in coming, rising 6th to 12th grader, you can come to youth group. It's from 6 to 7.30. Please see Robin if you have any questions. Pajama party, kindergarten through 8th grade. Okay, we all wear our clothes, not our pajamas on that Sunday. On July 28th, find Robin with questions. Now, let us begin our worship. Good morning. I invite you to join me as you are able in the call to worship. The earth is the Lord's. Everything in creation belongs to God. This is the Lord's house. All who hope in the Lord will be called children of God. This is the hour for worship and song. And please join me in the prayer of invocation. Gracious God, as we gather in your house of worship, we are reminded that everything in creation belongs to you. We lift up our eyes to see your mighty works with open our hearts to receive your gracious gifts. In this hour of worship and song, we reflect on the mystery of your plan. Open our hearts and minds to your words. Amen. And now Tina will lead us in some music. All right, so we're starting with God of Wonders. It's found on the screen or in the supplemental hymnals. I was playing it a little bit as we entered. It's been a while, I think, since we've celebrated this one together. But let's lift our voices together, okay? with me.
And if the children would like to join me on the steps this morning, they can. All right, I have a geography lesson. Today, we're going to start studying the book of Ephesians for the next six weeks. And so, can you all move in a little closer? Because I'm going to show you a book. Because I thought you would want to see it. So you can come up and look at this too. Um, So we're going to talk about Ephesians, the people who lived in Ephesus. And I know that Mrs. Bazan did uh, a good job showing you where things happened on her globe in the story time, right? And I think all of you were at Vacation Bible School last week. So here's a globe. Can someone find us on the globe? Pretty close. We're right here. We're right there. It's easy, right? Because we're at the tip of Lake Michigan, so we don't have to look too far. And then the town we're going to talk about in ancient um, Near East was in modern Turkey. And do you know where that is? Can you find that on here? It's right here, right? Turkey is right here. And so all of the things that we talked about are today and then for the next six weeks all happen in this ancient town in Turkey, which is, you can see here, so if you can come close to this book, you can see some cool things. So for example, you can see how they built these roads. We think about our highways and how we can get across the country, and they're done with those big machines, right, and rollers, and (laughs) right, some amazing things. They didn't have those tools but they were able to build these roads, so they're pretty sophisticated. And then this is, Paul took all these different journeys. So you can see, this is Greece, right? Maybe you can identify Greece, and you can see all the different places. And then what I wanted to show you was this. This is what a home would look like. In our homes, right, we have a living room, and a kitchen, and a place to sleep. And their homes were built a little bit different, but they still had a place to eat, and an entrance, and a kitchen, and a place to gather, and some bedrooms. So our houses today are very much, in some ways, similar to the architecture of the houses of the people that we talked about. So it's going to be interesting as we learn about the people of Ephesus. So that's what I wanted to show you. Any questions? Nope. Okay. Let's pray. I'll pray a line, and then we'll pray it up to God together. Dear loving God, God, we thank you for being able to learn learn about the people from so long ago ago and how they connect to our story today. Amen. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. And now we have come to a time of prayer. Both here in person and at home. I invite you, if you're at home, to pray silently, to put your prayer requests in the, in the Google online form as you look at those, um, and or in the chat. Now let's begin our time of prayer.
celebrate, we're gonna go to Niagara Falls, so. All right. Yeah. That's prayers of joy for the last immune therapy treatment and a wonderful trip to Niagara Falls. May you feel the love and support of this church family always, Kathy, and uh, may you have a wonderful and safe trip as God watches and enjoys with you. God in our grace, hear our prayers, or God in your grace. We will continue praying for those that have not been lifted up. God, we pray for Zeb Bezrikoff for healing and patience as she continues to receive her treatment. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. Prayers for of thanksgiving and concern and all of the feelings for Wyatt Jones and Finn Walker as they continue to receive treatment and have joy and shed tears as they grow. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. We pray for Tom and Sandy as they continue to be treated for cancer. God, may they feel the love of this church family. May we also be reminded that they are mourning the loss of an uncle, a friend, a brother-in-law. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have had a lot to celebrate today. Some good news of people recovering. We've had some sad, thoughtful news of, of people who need healing. And that is what this church family is here to do, to celebrate and to be sad together. So now let us help the church to continue its good work by considering our gifts to give to God. Now let us receive our morning offering.
Now let us pray together the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Holy One, as we contemplate the mystery of your plan, we dedicate these gifts to the work of unraveling that mystery through prayer, study, and faithful living. Use them to reveal more of your truth and grace to us. Amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture reading comes from the first book, first chapter of Ephesians, verses 3 through 14, the spiritual blessings in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he has set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory, in him you also, when you have heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. God, there is so much that we hear about in the news. Things that are scary. The shooting of a former president. The violence and the war in the Middle East and in Africa. God, there is just so much. And we ask you to be here with us as we consider what it means to do your work and to strive to do and live our lives that engage our faith in real and present ways. God, I ask you to be with me as we consider the book of Ephesians and the letter and the work of Paul. Amen. I was on Facebook last night and uh, there is a big who's rewriting their sermon for this morning. And I thought to myself, not it, <laughs> right? What we've been doing is we've been considering how to live an engaged life, how to, how to be God's work in the world. What spoke to me as I was um, on Facebook again this morning, and this was posted by Nuns Against Violence. And it's him for healing and for hurting, or him for hurting by Amanda Gorman. So as we think about engaged living, I think that Amanda's words can help focus us as we start to talk about what God's plan might be. Him for the hurting. Everything hurts. Our hearts shadowed and strange. Minds made muddied and mute. We carry tragedy, terrifying and true, and yet none of it is new. We knew it as home, as horror, as heritage. Even our children cannot be children, cannot be. Everything hurts. It's a hard time to be alive and even harder to stay that way. We're burdened to live out these days while at the same time blessed to outlive them. 
This is alarm. This alarm is how we know we must be altered, that we must differ or die, that we must triumph or try. Thus, while hate cannot be terminated, it can be transformed into a love that lets us live. So this morning, as we consider the mystery of God's plan and start our six-week endeavor into learning about Ephesians, let us keep Amanda's word in mind that love does transform, and God's love does transform. And so here is Paul's missionary journey. And so I wanted to just remind us that we're talking about Asia. We're talking about Turkey. We're talking about the places that are in the news today and locations to the rest of the world. Oftentimes we think about our Western Christianity as based in European philosophy, um, European thinking. And, and the Christianity that we have here today is much like that. But back in the time of Paul, the apostle, as he wandered and traveled, it took place in the Middle East. And, and those are the three missionary journeys as um, he traveled and spread the word of God and spread this love that can transform. And so Paul's ministry in Ephesus, when he was there, he did a lot of work. And when he was there, and this is from Acts 19, and so transforming and teaching the good news of Christ's love, the miraculous signs but through healing, but as he preached in the temples and as he preached in the theaters and on the streets, he was met with conflict and opposition because the economy was based on the economy was well, the economy was based on um, cult of the Greek gods like Artemis, and so the temples were making money from the religious traditions of ancient Greece. And so we first consider the geography. And so that is a um, arena. It was a seaport. Ephesus is on the edge of what is now modern day Turkey, right? And so and Paul was there the longest and it was a thriving port city. It was a hustle and bustle. But as the economy began to deteriorate, as Paul got there, it wasn't at the top of the, the bustling and the, the time where society was really thriving in the city, it was starting to have some real struggles, partly because they were trying to keep the harbor viable. So we think about our harbors today, we think about what we need to do today to keep the edges of our country, the edges of the world safe, right? They had to drudge the port and able to get the boats in and out. Drudging the port. When we think about drudging the port, we think about, you know, again, mechanical machines that are big that help to build dams and to clean ports. They didn't have that back then, but they did know to do it. So I, I think that's important when we think about the ancient Near East, when we think about this time in our history, we, when we think about these things, we have to remember that there was some very good thinking and remarkable buildings like the um, Temple of Aramaeus, Ere right? And that is one of the seven wonders of the world. And the traditional cults that were um, talked about, I talked about, mentioned slightly before they were there. And so if we think about cults today, uh, we think about scary cults that you join, right? That people join and take money. But when we talk about cults, really, we're thinking about cults back in, in this area of um, Asia Minor, and we're thinking about cults in terms of religious groups. So Christianity, right, started as a cult before it became a major religion. So we're not thinking about cults in our modern context. We're thinking about cults in this ancient context, more of the, the specific definition. And there was not only these Roman gods and Greek gods, there was also Judaism 
present in this area. So it was very much a hub of travel, of thought, and there were theaters and private dwellings and baths and aqueducts, all of these things that were in the city of Ephesus. So this is important why, right? Geography informs how we relate to the world around us, right? We think about Lake Michigan, how easy it is to find Chicago. We think about that means we have access to water. Here, we don't have access to Lake Michigan water yet. There's work to do it, to bring Lake Michigan water here. Uh, we have well water right now. So our, how we operate, how we spend our money on water, how we look to get, we're informed by our geography. We are also informed by our economy, right? We're, we, I know more about farming than I did a little under two years ago, right? Because I am, I am talking and learning about farming, right? Our geography informs our economy, informs how we live and how we function. Those are really important to think about as we start to look at the book of Ephesians. So in, in the book of Ephesians was likely written by Paul. Some of the epistles, the letters that he sent out were not always written by him. Ephesians was likely um, written by Paul. He, it was sent to the people of Ephesus a few years after he had been there for so long. What is unique about the book of Ephesians and the letter that was written is that it was written as his theology. It was for all people. It was an open letter to be read. It was a message for all of God's people, for those who worship Roman gods or Greek gods or Jewish, non-believers. It was a message for all. And chapters 1 through 3 are a theological teaching, and chapters 4 through 6 are exhortations. So this is the book of Ephesians. And as we listen to the words that were spoken earlier in the first part of the book, it is, a, it is a poem, it is a hymn for us to think about the new life that Christ brings. And the word inheritance is there. God's blessings are inheritance, dimensions of hope. Our inheritance is a lot of things that Christ has left us, right, that Christ teaches us. And in that, we are blessed because it teaches us to see hope, hope where there is no hope, to hang on to hope after we hear bad news, the dimensions of hope. Our blessings are hope. Our blessings are the new life that Christ brings us. Each day is a new day. Today we begin again after the horrors in the news. Today we begin again. There is forgiveness. There is forgiveness as we work through the struggles and the hate in this country. There is forgiveness. And that is important to remember because there is a lot of trial and error in making things better. And the act of being able to forgive or being forgiven is important. It also means that no one is beyond hope. No one is beyond hope. That all can be redeemed, and all can be whole, right? The salvation. We think about salvation that is talked about in the book of Ephesians. It is, it is going to heaven. It is doing God's work in the world today. It is being a whole person, feeling that your soul is well, right? Is it well with your soul? And the Holy Spirit, right, in the, in the scripture, kissed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here working among us. So this brings us to this plan, right? If God's plan for us, what does that mean? God has a plan. Does that mean that God is responsible for all of the bad in the world? Is God responsible for what happened yesterday in the news? Is God written... I, I think we need to think about this in some, some new, old, and important ways, right? So this scripture this morning, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, verses 9 and 10. With all wisdom and insight, 
He has made known to us the mystery of his will. The mystery of his will. Right? There's this mystery of God's plan. The mystery of what Christ calls us to do. Mystery. According to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. The fullness of time. There is hope because it doesn't have to be fixed today. To gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So as we engage the mystery of our faith today and the mystery of Christ's plan as revealed in Ephesians, we find that God's guidance, right, illuminates, lights our path while allowing the freedom, the free will to navigate our journey, offering redemption in our regrets and unity in Christ. Unity in Christ. That's, that's what we need right now. <laughs> right? Unity and diversity and unity in Christ. And so in this mystery of our faith and stories that we hear and we tell, there is connection to the words in Ephesians. There's connection to this plan. And so I want to talk about, that's um, Mount Kilimanjaro. And so we're going to talk about uh, Ernest Hemingway's short story, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. And I don't know who's familiar with it. It was a movie in the 1950s. Um, this is, I'm focusing on the words of Hemingway, the short story. So two people, Harry and Helen, are married. And they're on safari in Africa. And they, Harry is hurt. And we begin to see Harry talk about the pain in his leg as he has gangrene and he can't get help, and he can't get out. So Helen, Helen is there, his wife, listening and trying to help him. So as he begins to, to lose his, his senses, right, as he becomes sicker and sicker, he reflects on his life in Paris, where he wanted to write but never wrote. He looked at the remembered the stories, the horrific stories and trauma of serving in World War I. He remembered the 1920s and how it was fun and an escape, but not necessarily real. And Helen li listened, right? So how is it then, why is it possible, if we talk about this like it's a true story, because there are times in life where we are not with someone who is not healing, someone who is not well, someone who is hurting, could be life or death or whatever it is, they're there. Why did God then let that happen? So as we begin to consider, these are some of Harry's words, right? I wanted to share with you. There was so much to write. He had seen the world change, right? Witness all of the things in the world that had changed. Not just the events, although he had seen many of them and had watched the people, but he had seen the subtler change and he could remember how the people were at different times. He had been in it and he had watched it. And it was his duty to write of it, but now he never would. It was his regret that he was never going to live the life he wanted because he was dying. So, the mystery of our faith. The mystery of our faith. Why does horrors happen, right? The mystery of Christ's plan. When we think about the book of Ephesians, oftentimes it's, we think about the household cold, codes that are in there, or specific instructions of what to do. But those were for the times of Paul. For us, we can see Paul's wider an important theology of Christ's work in the world. The mystery of our faith. How is it that things happen to one person one way, or one group one way, and not the other? And then there's this mystery of Christ's plan. Christ's plan for us to be unified, to, to understand that 
We are all human beings. We are of one mind. We are different in so many ways, but those differences have been assigned back then and today, and there's this mystery of Christ's plan. And so how then do we engage this mystery? So for me, I re- this is from Bible study, but if you haven't read this book, you should. It's a good book. When bad things happen to good people. Um, there's these three sentences, phrases, that come from Kushner's um, writings, right? God is all-powerful. God, God is completely good. Evil exists. We begin with the three statements, he says, only two of which can be true. God is all-powerful. God is completely good, and evil exists. So I know, in my mind, God is completely good. God is good, right, all the time. God is good all the time. I know, as I witness the events in the news, and I talk to people about their stories, I believe evil exists. And how we define that and think about that is for a different day. So does that mean, then, that God is not all-powerful? In some ways, That's a relief because we know God didn't cause the Holocaust. God didn't cause cancer. God did not cause our loved ones to struggle. God did not cause the violence that we see, right? Also, then, a little scary because we put our faith in God as we engage God in the everyday and in the light and in the love. We have a choice. We have choices to act in good and important ways in our world. And that is what is the gift of God. That is the blessing that we've inherited, that we have free will, and that we are able to be agents of change. So this is from the artist Drake. Who knows the artist Drake? Good. I was introduced to the artist Drake uh, last week when I was talking with someone, and she said, you know, there's this song called God's Plan, and so I listened to it, and Drake is a rapper. Yes, Robin, it is you. (laughs) So this is, Drake is a Christian. Drake, uh, the video, he's going out and helping people and hugging people and talking to people. So in these words, as I read them, he's focused on God and his life. God's plan, God's plan. I can't do this on my own. A, a, no A. Someone watching this stuff close, yep, close. I've been me since the Scarlet Road, A, Road A. Might go down as G-O-D, yeah, wait. I go hard on the south side, D, which is God, A, way. I make sure that north, Side E. I know. Okay, Luke, do you want to do it? Okay. (laughs) I'm not rapping for you this morning. (laughs) Uh, Way, I make sure that north side E, yeah, and still bad things, right? Still bad things. Gives food, helps, does this work in the world, still bad things. It is words from Amanda Gorman, a poet. It is words from Drake, a poet and a writer, a songwriter, right, a performer. These are words that are with us today as they were back when Ephesus was struggling and needed help, and Paul was there saying, this is how we can make things better. So how can we faithfully engage in God's plan? God's plan for us to be unified in our diversity unified as people, right, unified as humans, right? We pay attention 
We pay attention to what is going on in the world. And then we remember there's this dimensional hope. I, I love this phrase, dimensional hope, because hope isn't flat. Hope isn't, I hope for the sun to come out. The, the hope is the sun comes out and the new day is brighter and better. Something changes. It is multidimensional hope. And that we face challenges knowing that Christ loves us. We face challenges knowing that we are a community grounded in engaging God's love for us in this world. And we do that by building communities, right? Building communities that help and love and are transformed by God. Amen. God, we ask you to be with this country, this country that struggles with violence and conflict and hate. We ask you to help us to see our dimensional hope and the dimensions of hope that take time by engaging the mystery of our faith, the knowledge that things will be okay in some way or another, God. Help us to not give up that hope. Help us to understand that you're here supporting us and surrounding us and filling us with the spirit, helping us to make the right choices and to engage living and to be the good people you call us to be. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now let us rise and join and sing, Here I Am, Lord.
before we sing the Alleluia, I want to draw our attention to two words in our sanctuary this morning in our new banners, peace and hope. Peace and hope. So I want to thank Nancy and Sue for getting those today for us this morning because we need hope and we need peace. So now let us join hands and raise our hands as we sing the Alleluia together. As we go out, let's remember God's multidimensional hope that is there for us and help us to engage the love that God asks us to share. Amen. Amen.